27th of February is always a special day for me and for my, for my family. It's my mother's birthday. And um, she was in Bombay. So that morning, I'd gone to Bombay and then planning to spend a couple of days there. And suddenly towards noon, I get a call from a journalist to say, Father, don't you know what's happened? There is a train that has been burnt and people. So I said, anything that is of that tragedy should be condemned. It was in parliament. I saw it in the news where the prime minister at that time said it was an accident, Bajpayee and um, everything was being looked into. On the 28th afternoon, I got another call, I was still in Bombay, saying that Gujarat is burning because in the wake of a Maha Aarti that was being held, uh, people broke loose and started attacking, mainly the Muslims of the city. I took the first flight that was available and I came back. In the meantime, people were calling me from all parts of India. Also my friends have been quite connected with, with people from different places, Shabnam Hashmi, Tista Settlebad and so on. And a matter of time, our center became a hub, Prashant, for a lot of human rights activists, journalists, people who wanted to come to know what was happening. In a matter of days, okay, on the 1st of March, I heard that a friend of mine, Ishan Jaffrey, who used to come here to wish me for Christmas, I had to go to wish him for, um, for Eid. And I was very close. I used to call his wife Ami, my mother. Okay, Jakya Bain. So I went with a couple of other fathers. I got a, a permit from the, from the collectorate office to go into these areas. And on the 1st of March already, uh, I went there to Gulbarga Society and what I saw, I've testified about it in the US Commission for International Religious Freedom all over, will remain forever etched in my memory. I did not find my friend Eshan Jaffrey there. There was nothing, but I saw still plenty of dead bodies there. And whenever I've gone back to Gulbarga society, it only evokes very, very painful memories. We know what happened to Eshan Jaffrey. It was very sad. He was the face of secular India. He was the face that encompassed all that was good of benevolence, of reaching out to others, of trying to address the division that is in society. All the poor people, what we call the lariwalas, those who, the small vendors, could go to many time and he would give them money if they needed. People in the, for the people in the society, he was the one who could help them in any time of need. And I know from eyewitness accounts that Ishan Jaffrey called everyone on that fateful day. But when he went to the gate, they took him. We are told that they just butchered him and then even burnt him, burnt his mortal remains. And that I think should not happen to any human being anywhere in the world at any time but this has taken place in the city of Ahmedabad. I spoke at a, at a conference in 2003 in San Jose, organized by the Indian, now American Muslim Council. And I said, that day when I realized what happened to Ishan Jaffrey, I said, I, I will not rest till a man like him has been vindicated. I don't believe in revenge. I don't believe in hate. My religion, my God, Jesus teaches me to love others, to forgive others. But the point is for such a thing to happen to any human being, and especially to a man like Ishan Jaffrey, means that we have to do all that we can to ensure that his soul rests in peace 
here in Ahmedabad and that justice is done to all the injustice, to all the hate that has been done to him and to hundreds and thousands of others. Like, uh, you heard about the call he made to the... Yes, everything. He made a call to everybody, to all the leaders of the Congress party, to the chief minister um, and everyone at that time. So someone apparently told him, are you still alive? That is, uh, you know, I, uh, there were people who were there with him in the house, you know, and um, that is, you can speak to a person like Rupa Modi or anybody, all the eyewitnesses, and there are they are terrible. He tried to help anyone who, who he could. Even today, Rupa Modi was looking for a son, Azhar, to come back home. You know, it is happened in 2002, and all these years, now we are going to complete this year, 19 full years, um, still waiting, waiting, waiting. It's sad. and. Yes, I was very well connected because the school that we are in, we had the police commissioner of Ahmedabad, his children were studying in the school at Good Equations. There was a team that had come in from, from, from Delhi, Kamal Mitra Chinoy and Achin Vanayak and so on. So I took them to all the violent areas. And the police commissioner saw me and said, Father Prakash, what are you doing here? I said, I'm just, uh, you know, he said, but you're not supposed to be here. I said, sir, I've got a... Then he took us to the to the his uh, a police station there, and they began asking him. It is already it is it is recorded in a little report done by uh, this Saftar Hashmi Trust, okay, um, and uh, he began crying. The then police commissioner of Ahmedabad, he's saying, "I am helpless too. I am helpless too." And everybody knew that orders came from above. The question we need to ask ourselves, fine. There was the train that was burnt. There were some 56, 59 people who were killed in Godhra on that 27th of February. Ayodhya, people are coming back from Ayodhya. Many of them were in reserve compartments, but without ticket. And there was a rumor of some girl being pulled down in the, into the train at the Godra station. The train came in at Godra late. And then at that signal fadia, apparently um, the train stopped, somebody pulled the chain. People from both sides were pelting the train. There is enough of evidence to show there is no way the people who are there below, I've been there very often, can set fire to the train. They were throwing stones, they were throwing bottles and so on. There is every possible evidence, there are plenty of evidence to show that those in the train were making this cocktail Molotov, Molotov cocktails and throwing the firebombs. And then because they had lots of, uh, lots of things with them in order to throw on the bastis and so on, while they were coming back from Ayodhya in the night. It was the Faisabad Express, uh, coming from Faisabad to Sabarmati. And um, one of the compartments at six caught fire. It was very tragic, okay? But the people were definitely not, they were throwing stones, yes, okay? From the bastis who are mainly Muslims, okay? But they did not set the train on fire. That was proved. Lalu Prasad later on had uh, has railway minister had an investigation and so on. There is enough of evidence to show that people do not set the train on fire. The question we need to ask ourselves: the BGP Shiv Sena was running Maharashtra. Okay, there is um, a Madhya Pradesh government there. Godra is close to Madhya Pradesh. There is the UP. Why did no violence take place anywhere else but only in Gujarat? 
clearly because the chief minister at that time just gave orders, so let's teach these people a lesson. And he has never, 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 never changed, said that I do not say it. He has not, uh, you know, he has used all kinds of, of reasons and justifications and things like that. There's not a single bit of, when the Babri Masjid was destroyed, there was a lot of attacks all over the country. How is it there were no attacks in Maharashtra after the Godhara train burning? How is it there were no attacks in Madhya Pradesh? This is the question nobody has the courage to ask because it only happened in Gujarat and in certain major cities and all focused in areas where Muslims were living. And this went on. They could have contained the violence if they wanted in a matter of two or three days. They could have got the army, never called the army. It was on standby. And after a period of time, what had happened was, was people continued to be attacked in different parts, in the villages. They were sent out, hundreds and thousands of people from Places like Naroda Party and so on had to move to a place called Siddiqabad, okay? Outside to take refuge there. They lost everything. And we have had um, terrible violence in Gulbarka society, in Naroda Partia, and in other places of the city, okay? Even those who were living here, Muslims, in this western side of the city, had to leave and go and seek shelter, even in other parts of, in the eastern parts of the city, or outside the state of Gujarat. See, there are three things that happened simultaneously. Three things. One is there was a meticulousness in the, uh, in the violence. There was planning. Okay? That we have to remember. Just as the Jews were targeted during the time of the Nazi regime, okay, they knew, they had the records, they had where, they knew where the chippas had their restaurants, on the highway and they attacked it and so on. It was one. Secondly, what we have seen in Gujarat in different times, okay, there is a spontaneity, there is a mob violence, but it is not merely sporadic. It's like how they go, went to Gulbarga society. They were able to galvanize a huge mob Okay, and say, now let's attack this society. That is the... The third is, and I think this is very, very important, uh, they had a kind of a legitimacy. They knew they would get away with, with a certain amount of immunity they had, and they did it with impunity. So it was a terrible type of violence. Like, I was in Delhi in 1984 when the Sikhs were massacred. And I was running also uh, the Ludlow Castle camp. And a lot of the Sikhs, I don't justify that violence at all. It was terrible. But they attacked only the males. Here they attacked women. You know, we have terrible stories of women being attacked. They were raped. There is a whole document of the amount of women that were raped. They spoke about, um, you know, about all this all the time. The children were massacred. Children had this thing. We went to Lunawada and so on, and we found, you know, one of these graves there with the, with the bones of all kinds of people there. And they went and dumped them and so on. It was a most horrendous type of violence which modern India from 1947 has never experienced ever. And this will be, I think, the blackest period of India's democracy, what we call the Gujarat genocide or the Gujarat carnage. That was uh, who was the CMO at that point. Yeah. He got away, kind of a got Yes. Away. And he is now the chief of the state, of this nation. Of the nation. Yeah, you, he's a polarizing figure and he gained a lot of legitimacy. In fact, the Prime Minister came here and said, okay, um, you should follow Raj Dharma. They wanted to take him out because it gave a bad name, um, you know, put to the party 
and to the country. But then some or the other, there is a polarizing because very clearly in the walls, he, there were a lot of slogans at that time. Okay. Uh, Muslimano ke liye Pakistan, Christio ke liye Kabristan, Panlekin Hindu ke liye Hindustan. He polarized. And then he created bogey. There's, if you look at any analysis, any papers, the first rumor was that ISI created this. It was not ISI who created the Godhara train. Pakistan was not involved at all. Okay. So what um, he succeeded in doing is to show the others that um, Pakistan is interfering in India. The ISI is interfering, that we have to beware of the Muslims. And then it creates a divide. Even today in the city of Ahmedabad, if you're a Muslim, you cannot buy a shop. You cannot own a shop. You cannot have an apartment in this western side of the city. Christians are still tolerated. And in this area is 100% what we would call you know, a Hindu area. If you have to be a Muslim, you have, you have to go and live in Jawapura, on the outskirts of the city, or on the eastern side of the city. You cannot... There are some people who are living here. We have a small Muslim society, not far away, but they are mainly academics, mainly professors, and so on. And then somewhere near the, the National School of Design, we have a few others, but these are the well-to-do um, people. But these are just few pockets, but the underlying understanding is that um, Muslims don't belong to Ahmedabad. They tried to change the name, they did not succeed and so on, because Ahmad Shah, a great uh, ruler, founded the city on the 26th of February, 1411. And we have a heritage city here because of Ahmad Shah. There was some kind of token relief. Most of the work, the camps were run by Muslims, were run by the, the masjids, okay? They were in areas or with NGOs. A lot of NGOs were helping, okay? Like in Shah Alam at Zarga, we had a very, very big camp where there were several thousands, okay? And we had it there. In one of our Catholic centers in Gomtipur, at the sister's place, Mother Nudava Kano, and there are a lot of Muslims there and Christians. So a lot of Muslims took shelter there for some days. Okay? So many, many people were, um, lived in camps. There were hardly any, there were token, some government cosmetic camps. And then they began saying that there are camps for Hindus and so on, which was a bluff. When, when President Abdul Kalam came here, they took him to a Hindu camp. Till the previous day, it was not existing. So on the day he came, they hastily brought up people from the slums to say, or roti, kapda, or, or rene ke liye to mil jayenge, do din ke liye. And um, so they had to live um, there. It was, these are cos cos cosmetic shows. But there was hardly any official relief camp where the government was concerned. Though because of the nature of the, of the seriousness of the violence, the collectorate and so on had to get its act together and some of the collectorate officials and all that. But the greatest safety that the Muslims felt happened only in the vicinity of a mosque where the dargah was and so on. Um, and that was very, very clear. Then comes the legal fight. Yes. So, um, together with several, Tista Settlebad was here, staying at my place, and we started uh, Citizens for Justice and Peace. And we constituted a um, Citizens Tribunal, headed by Justice Krishna Iyer, okay? And we had two excellent other judges there, Sorry. Justice Savant, who just died last week, and Justice Suresh, who died a few months ago. All now is happening. So all these three main people. And then we had some excellent other people in the, all Hindus, okay? There was Aruna Roy from Rajasthan. There was Kanabiran. He was the head of the PUCL in India. 
and there were a few a few others. There was Gansham Shah, um, you know, excellent citizens tribunal. And a lot of work was done by, they went to the camps, they went all over Gujarat, they met thousands of people. If you look at the report, it's an excellent report. We had a formal presentation here. Finally, because of the equations I had with Harin Pandya, who was uh, formerly the Home Minister of Gujarat, he came and testified and gave us all. And his name was there in the magazine. And then a little later, on the 26th of March, uh, 2003, he was, he was killed. Yeah. Um, Arun Pandya gave a, gave a very, very, very strong um, eyewitness account, a testimony of what actually happened. Um, and we know, then we have filed cases. Um, the Citizens for Justice and Peace have won. Many people who were responsible for the violence were, were incarcerated, were jailed, which was, we had a, there was a high degree of success in it. But many of the big players, you know, have got scot free. Um, there are still some kind of, and anyone who allowed these people to, to get scot free were promoted and given important positions in the government and so on. So you can look at all those who have been involved, you know, either in the special investigation team or whatever it is. All these have been very suitably rewarded by the so-called government of India. But the legal system also failed at one point of time. Like even though um, he is outside, he is someone who has said that he wants to kill more people. Yes. Uh, yes and no. We have had some good judgments that we have to accept. Okay. But by and large, yes. The judiciary was frightened. The judiciary was did not apply itself totally was not, as we saw just now in the presidential elections of the United States, it doesn't appoint, matter who appoints you. If you're a judge, if you're a magistrate, your allegiance, your loyalty is not to that person or not to the government, but to the constitution of the country. And that's where many of our judges have really failed, not merely individual citizens, but the constitution of India. Do you think what happened in Gujarat would happen again in Gujarat? We do not know. Because just now, they want to justify that people are safe. You know? But yes and no. To be you know, the way people are negated, ostracized, the way minorities are being treated, Already the other day at a public meeting for the this local elections, the chief minister spoke about bringing a love jihad law in Gujarat in the lines of UP and Madhya Pradesh. So the demonization, the denigration of the Muslims still continue. And we have a freedom of religion law, which Modi promised in 2003, um, in 2002 when he stood for um, elections at the end, then in 2003, on the 26th of March, the day Harin Pandya was assassinated, was killed, it was passed without opposition because the opposition walked out. It's basic, but it took five years to make the rules, to frame the rules, which are needed to guide the implementation of the law. Like say for the CAA, they still do not have the, the rules, okay? Um, only when the rules are there, it can be challenged you know, um, in, in a court. We went to court and challenged it. So basically the rules say that if I want to change my religion, I must first seek the permission of the civil authority, the collector. Now I'm saying, who are you the collector to decide on matter of my faith? Today, maybe I'm a Christian. Tomorrow I want to stop believing in any God. I am convinced there is no God. So I've already decided. Now, do I have to come to you for a permission? You, you may tell me that atheism is not a religion, but I'm saying not believing in a God is also a religion. Okay, so if I want to embrace as an adult any religion of my choice, 
Okay? The only question I ask, if I want to embrace Hinduism, to which caste will I belong to? You know, but that people have no answer. One thing I want to like, you know, I really want to wrap it up. Uh, you have been to very conflict zones. Yes, a lot. A lot. Uh, and you are living in India. Yeah. What do you, what are the chances of India being somewhat, you know, do you think there's a genocide happening? I am very clear that the way this government is going, okay, uh, just now what they are doing, they are throwing balls of fire. 370 and 35A in Kashmir, what is happening in West Bengal, okay, the way they have treated the Rohingya Muslims who came in from Myanmar, okay, what is happening, just now the polarization in several states where the Muslims are concerned, you know, the laws of UP and MP, okay, this whole question of the cow cabinet, you know, um, what uh, the Chief Minister of Karnataka is saying, uh, these are things that what I call, uh, uh, you know, just little firebombs here and there, but suddenly it will burst. So, with such a large Muslim population in India, millions of people, the second largest in the world, I believe every single Muslim is a citizen of the country, has rights, has responsibilities, has any other, other person. This is not a Hindu nation. And they are trying to get into the whole idea of majoritarianism. How sure are you that this is not a Hindu nation? Because the constitution is, is we have the constitution. And people like us and many others, my best friends are Hindus. The average Hindu does not support the Hindutva ideology. But at the same time, I'm very frightened. Frightened that suddenly everything will be burst and we will have a genocide that has taken place in several parts of the world at a certain time. They are continuing to polarizing they continue buying up people, they continue to legitimize their agenda, and a lot of what we have seen in the agenda, you know, has been against the constitution of the country, against the secular and the pluralistic fabric of our nation. Um, um, everything. Um, and the way they incarcerate people, the they, way they badmouth human rights defenders, those who stand up for the rights of others, it's absolutely unbelievable. It is terrible. 